uh, during my during the breakout session, I actually was in a room with Scott, and we were talking a little bit about some of the various components that are coming out of Royal Life um, inside of those shows. And so I'm really interested and excited to hear him tell more about that because some of the stuff he was saying, you know, it was uh, unexpected benefits of it. And I think there's a lot of stuff that we can pull out from that show, and he can tell us a little bit more about today. It's been really exciting. Uh, awesome. I mean, we get, getting into it, like into it, guys. I mean, what, what's really been blowing my mind recently about working inside of Royal Life, especially with this Royal Life Planner, is about how uh, precise the awareness becomes of what's going on. I see Charlie shaking his head in here too, yep. because yep. It, what, what's really amazing about it is like, is with the precision of the awareness of what's happening, the solution becomes easy to find. I think a lot of us probably run around here and being like, well, I need to find out like what to do, right? I need to, I need to uh, absorb more information, right? I need to do all of these things. I got this master task list and I, and we run a belief system that says like the more that I do, the better off I'm going to be and the better investor I'm going to be, the faster I'm going to accelerate my path to my cash flow um, and to my, uh, my net worth. <clears throat> and what, what we're finding out is with actually with high levels of planning and intentionality of here are the critical things that need to happen on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. It's actually not that much. It's actually not that much. The lists actually aren't that big. However, the awareness of my inability to do those things is very high, right? And how powerful is that? How powerful does that become? Because my list, I'm no longer burdened by saying my task list is so large, who could possibly get it done? I'm actually burdened with a separate question, which is, why is that thing that I know to do, I'm not doing? So one of the things that comes up here, guys, is I'll show you guys if uh, that are interested in this. We're going to kind of start in the middle of this presentation, then we're going to work our way backwards. So the first thing I want to show um, show you guys as we come into it is going to be is around this, uh, just this tool right here. This one section of the blue book has really been making huge strides for people. And that's right here. If you guys see here, this is like in the top of any of your weekly pages that you have, right? See here, this is your top goals for the week of like what things are the, the most important things for you to do for the week. And then here's where you list, what are my top three things I need to do for that day as part of this book? Now, what we found was um, coming through here is that all of these pieces, there would be, there would be people would list out, hey, this is what I need to do here. None of these were actually that difficult, but what we found is like these kept moving forward over and over again. You, they just kept getting kicked down the road and they got kept getting kicked down the road in a way that before people were saying, well, hey, I didn't even know that that's what I was doing, right? But because they had to rewrite what are the top three things I had to do each day, now I become aware of what that is. And then the questions become much deeper. It was like, okay, so what's going on with you and inside of your world that's keeping you from doing the things that you have pre-identified before you even started that day as being the most important things for you to get done that day? What's happening? right? And let's have the discussion about that. And what we find is that it's actually just really simple belief systems that have to get shifted, right? It's a belief system that around like, if I do really well with my accounting, it's going to be really painful for me because I actually like being inside of the creative space of the business. I don't like being in the numbers, right? But, they'll under but the, this one student really understood that the numbers were critical, so they had a, a level eight urgency on getting to the numbers and the financials, but we're spending zero time doing it. So they had like a level two commitment to actually getting it done internally. And what that was causing was this continual chug in the back of the mind about like, hey, I need to do that thing. And how much energy does that waste? How much energy does not go into actually driving towards things that are going to help you achieve because you're burning that mental energy? The student was burning that mental energy. There, right? So then we had, then we started to talk about like, okay, what are the strategies that you could do um, to be able to make it where you can uh, do the work, but do it in a, in a way that you can get yourself to actually make incremental progress. So you can shift the belief system that, yay, yeah, tracking the numbers isn't painful for me. It actually is empowering. It gives me confidence that what I'm doing is right, right? It's not going to be this other side of it, which is the, um, the current belief system, which is, well, it's nothing but pain once I get into the numbers. Well, who's going to choose make a choice that gives them nothing but pain? Nay, me. I ain't willing to do that. For me to do something, I have to believe that it's going to be good for me. So sometimes you can find through these tools 
like I just showed you guys here, that the tool itself will give you the awareness to say something ain't working. And that's a hell of a lot better than not knowing that it ain't working. Because once you know that it ain't working, at least you're aware of it. You can talk to about it with a community of people and find out who's had a problem like this before and how, what did they do to be able to work their way out of it? And that's the power of the community and power of the group. But that's on the action oriented side of things. That's on the execution um, <clears throat> side of, of the fence. And Charlie, I'll just have you hold on for one second because I want to walk through this, the financial freedom calculator uh, with everybody here in case they haven't seen it before as our top level steering wheel. So guys, I, we're all in this game together because we're doing what? We're making money, right? I mean, that's what binds us here together is we want the freedom to be able to live the lives that we want to do. We understand the way that we got to do that first is being able to put the oxygen mask on ourselves to be able to have the cash flow and the net worth to make sure that we're provided for, that we're safe, we're taken care of, that the people in our lives and our families are taken care of. And then when we have that level of freedom, we can go out and do amazing things in the world because we're going to be inside of our ability to be safe. So the question is, is what the heck does that mean? When's the last time we sat down and actually had to clearly define, when am I going to feel safe enough, right? Money is just an, a, is a, is a, as a way to have security, right? I mean, that's really all it is. It's a way for me to feel that if something bad happens in life, that I have a way that I can have resources, uh, to either accelerate something that I want to build, but also that I'm going to be okay, right? For most of us, when you dig down deep into like what money is about, it's really a fear of not having money, right? Which is really a, a question about saying, well, that just means that I don't feel safe yet. And what do I need to do to feel safe? But without saying clearly that this is what I need to feel safe, what are you telling your brain every day? I'm not safe. What does that lead to? Frantic working, overworking, stressing yourself to be able to push super hard. Whether it's the right thing to do or not, we don't know, but we know that we're not safe. So we're going to go ahead and just keep working super hard about it, right? So what I would like to offer you guys today is the opportunity to look at this tool with me that with, with my experience has been in using this tool for myself and coaching other people with, and it is you're able to dial in such a level of clarity of what it is that you need to achieve that it does two things. One, it puts your mind at ease because now you have a really clear target, right? It's a smart goal of a target you need to get to. So that tells your brain, great. All I have to do is figure out how to get there to that point. And now the spectrum of what your brain has to think about isn't, I'm not safe. It's great. Let me look for opportunities. Let me activate my reticular activator to start scanning for opportunities that help accelerate my path to that specific endpoint of what that looks like. The second thing that it does is it provides you a way to be able to see what's broken in your finances, right? Where are you not making, where are you not achieving best practices or standard types of uh, standard types of returns, right? So you'll see that in a number of different ways, whether it could be like, hey, you're overpaying on your taxes, or hey, my actual net worth in proportion to my cash flows is actually way lower than I thought. I got, I'm, I was a person that was a victim of this. I don't know if anybody else has been, but for early on in my career, the only thing that I cared about was what was my best deal. And I love to tell people about my best deal. I'm like, oh man, you wouldn't believe I made 150% you know, on that deal or I wholesaled this deal and made $40,000 last weekend. That was the only thing I cared about was that big deal that would come through. And for me, when I started using this tool, it shifted for me to be much more strategic to the endpoint I wanted to get to um, by focusing on the numbers, focusing on the flow of numbers and focusing on what is achievable. What should I expect uh, myself to be able to achieve here and by looking at what are the people that I have and that are similarly situated to me, smart people that are working really hard, um, that are inside of the same game I am. How are they doing? What are they paying in taxes? What is their net worth uh, to passive cash flow? What are their expenses? Like, am I living too big of a lifestyle or am I trying to be too cheap? you know, and, and how do I want to live and trying to cheat myself like on that end of it too. So I raised a lot of good questions for myself about like, hey, do, how do I know that I'm on course for being able to get um, to where I want to go to? And so before I dive into the financial freedom calculator, Charlie, did you have something that you wanted to contribute? 
Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, that was really poignant. I, I just this is all I wanted to say. I've I've written a ton of business plans because as an entrepreneur, I write a plan for everything I do. Um, but the thing that I've always told uh, people every time they ask me about wanting to get a business, I talk to them, of course, about starting with a simple plan and then expanding from that. What the Royal Life book does is it actually takes the elements of uh, in explaining to them about why you write a plan to begin with. It's a process of thought that it takes you through to even determine whether or not you want to get involved in that business um, as a whole. And what the Royal Life Planner does, it actually takes it down to a micro platform uh, in bite-sized pieces that gets you into the mindset, actually adjusts your numbers the way that um, you need to be going through it and actually looking to, to get to those places in, in a business plan and helping you to mold it. So it actually um, is an excellent tool. You know, that a lot of times people write the plan and then they step away from the plan, not realizing it's only the initial guide, you know. So I just wanted to comment on that because um, I see a lot of that, a tremendous amount of value in, in how it's used and, and the benefits there. So not only does it get you the financials and all that stuff in place, but it also gets you in the right mindset and helps you grow while you're getting, getting through the coaching as well, um, you know, through both you as well as the team, yeah, all together. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Thanks, Charlie, for the endorsement <coughs> of it. You know, <laughs> and, and come into it. We'll be selling books at the end of the show, except we yeah. don't. We can wait for free. So that's not a very good business plan for how this works right now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we'll go, let's go ahead and dive into the tool, guys. So what we're going to start first is the financial freedom calculator. The reason we start with the financial freedom calculator is because it's really the steering wheel. It's a steering wheel that gives you everything else because really what we're talking about is what are the three things that we really want to do? We want to increase our cash flow, increase our net worth, and reduce our tax liability. That's how we win, right? That's the financial game. As long as you're hitting those three things, um, you're going to crush it. Now, uh, this tool then will give you a steering wheel for you to be able to see um, with more granularity about how is that working, right? And with that granularity of how's that working, that will then drive you into what actions do I need to do to get this to change, right? Because then I'll have a different level of awareness that tells me here's what I really need to do. That simplifies your life because then those become only the most important things to do, right? If we're in this game to make money, right? Then it's give me awareness around the money and then I'm gonna create my top to-do items that are around being able to generate the most money, that means your to-do items really won't be that big. They won't be a massive amount of to-do items. They shouldn't be anyway. If you're focused on the right ones, there shouldn't be a ton of to-do items to have to do. Into it. So let's just go ahead, guys, and I'm going to go ahead and just dive through and talk through um, the calculator from top to bottom. Um, if you guys have some comments as we're going through or questions about any of these items, go ahead and drop them into the chat, okay? All right, cool. So here, this is the finance, This is the one we have for the beginning of like the second quarter. Inside of your Royal Life Planner, we have we uh, have this built in to be able to do at the very beginning of each quarter because that's your typical touch point. Really hard to influence finances more um, in a really uh, intentional way, uh, more so than just uh, quarter over quarter. If you looked at um, inside where we're at right now, we're at page 55 um, inside of the planner. So if you have it on the PDF or if you have your physical copy, I'm just here on page 55 for that. Um, so the first thing that we look for um, when you look at the financial freedom planner is you see this number. This is your financial freedom percentage number. This number is actually calculated um, by taking your um, expenses. It's the ratio of your expenses to cash flow. Right. What we want to say is like if you're 100 percent, that means your cash flow is equaling your expenses, your monthly expenses. So if you had here, you say, hey, cool. What's my percentage number? Um, currently, let's say I'm at a, like a 10 percent. By the end of this quarter, where do I want to be? I, I want to be at 12 percent. Um, you know what? I had some badass deals come through for me. And where I actually end up at the end of the quarter would be 15 percent, for example. Right. Or it could, it could be lower. Right. Whatever that happens to be. But we're always going to say, cool, at the start of the quarter, we're going to start with what's our current, what's our target that we believe that we can get to. And then we're going to revisit at the end of the quarter to say, how did we actually do that quarter? Right. So if we reviewed this at the end of the year, we would be able to start looking at to saying, well, how good am I? Where am I at? How good am I being able to predict where I'm actually going to go to? How good, this is another way of saying, how good am I at being able to set reasonable expectations for myself and what I'm actually capable of? If you're not doing that, you're probably driving yourself crazy. And okay, what's actually happening? 
right? So you can start to see your own mental game you're playing about where you're at, where do you think you want to get to, and what are you actually capable of? When you dial this in, this is how you get peace in your life around your finances, around what you're doing. Because the upset that we feel, the self-judgment that we feel for ourselves is almost always because these, there's a disparity between these two things. It's what the goals are, what I'm actually able to do. And we put so much pressure on ourselves about being so great, right? Because we hear Gary V or we hear, um, you know, one of these other motivational guys that are just like, well, you can just blow it up and make it a billion percent. Awesome. I believe every single one of us is capable of doing that, right? Maybe we're not capable of doing it tomorrow, right? What are we capable of doing now, right? Maybe setting reasonable expectations now is a good way for us to be able to um, do that. So the first thing you want to do is you're tracking this because we're, we're talking to always talking about, hey, this is the way that you have durable freedom is your financial freedom number. This is your durable freedom that makes it where you never have to go work another job to come into it. So the next line item that we go through is part of how do we calculate this financial freedom number? This is our passive income. So if I said my passive income was right now was you know $5,000 a month for my rental income, I'm going to pick up a new property. And with that new property, uh, I think I'm going to be able to get an extra thousand dollars a month, and uh, from that new property, and we'll see where I actually end up here at the end of the quarter. But that's one way you would determine your goal, which is okay. What do I reasonably foresee can happen in the next three months? What will be the economic impact of that? Your active income. This is where we typically talk about um, active income is where you're having to trade time for money directly right? We understand that there's no such thing as like a really truly passive income that is a hundred percent passive, right? There usually things take some type of mental energy, even in the passive income space, but here is in the active income is where I'm like trading time for money. So for me, what I look at is like, these are like my, these are my investments, like houses, uh, stocks, my options trading that I do, my oil and gas investments, et cetera. Those are all what I would consider things that I consider for my passive income. And my active income um, is um, all of the Royal Life companies that I do, right? So it's what are the income that I'm generating from Royal uh, Legal Solutions, Royal Insurance, Royal Tax, um, et cetera. Because those are my, my major um, trading time for money types of focuses. So what this should tell you after you add your passive and your active income together, this will now tell you your total income. So just from this filling out these two places right here, right? You, what you'll be able to see is, well, where, where am I strong and where am I weak? Am I killing it on active income? Am I, am I doing like 150 or $200,000 a year on my active income, but my passive income is super low? What's happening here? Why, what's the disparity between these two points? But that'll tell you what your total income is. Next, what we need to do is start looking at what our expenses are going to be. Right. Remember the game is it's not what you make. It's what you keep. Right. This is our make. And this is this is what you're focused on keeping. This is your keeper number is going to be around your expenses. Right. Now, I'll tell you a secret. The secret is that nobody knows what their expenses are. <laughs> right. That's right now. You'd be like, ah, I think it's I think it's eight thousand dollars a month right? You could pick a number for me. I guarantee you the number you pick for me is going to be less than what it actually is. Nobody knows what they are and everybody completely underestimates what their actual expenses are, right? So it becomes very important for us to have levels of clarity because without clarity and awareness, how could we possibly make a change to what this is, to what's going on in our lives, what's going on with our finances? What we also found out from doing some of the work in Royal Life was that the, even the act of having to look at expenses bring, can bring up severe personal challenges for people, right? Because when you have to look at your expenses, you have to start asking hard questions. One could be, how in the heck do I get my wife to spend less money, right? Or husband or insert whoever, kids, whatever it's going to be. So all of a sudden, once I'm aware of the expense, man, that can start to feel scary because now it's right in front of my face of what here's what life is really going on. I can't put a blinder to it, right? That can feel scary to people. Number two can be is even doing the work of getting into expenses can feel like it's a challenge with their spouse because they're like, well, I'm not really a numbers guy. She really does that. And by the way, if we start doing all this financial analysis, do we really have enough time for our relationship? There's all kinds of great excuses. There are not to look at your expenses 
And they're all fantastic because they're great stories we can tell ourselves about why looking at the the big scary monster of what our expenses are is something that's not going to be great for us. So I'll tell you, when you look at this and you get and you get to the expenses and you start to feel challenged by it, you're going to tell yourself the story. Very likely, if you're like the other students I've worked with, you'll start to tell yourself the story that I can't do it. It's too complex. Is it really that valuable for me anyway? I'm not really interested in changing my lifestyle, yada, yada, yada. You're going to find the best excuses you've ever found or the best reasons to justify not looking at your expenses. What you got to do is just ignore all that bull. Got to just ignore all of that and do it anyway and get to the number. I can guarantee you after you get to the number once, it's very, very simple going forward. You won't have the same challenges. It's like getting back into the gym. Anybody ever take like six months off and try to get back into the gym after you're 30? It's terrible. Just everything about it's terrible, you know, end of there. But it's like six weeks into it, you're like, all right, cool. I'm back in shape and I'm rocking and rolling. I'm doing great again, right? Same kind of thing here. It's the first hump of getting used to being able to look at this is the big move. But then after that, um, you will find that it will actually be just as easy as breathing. It'll just become part of your analysis. And in fact, you'll start to get excited about it because you'll start to really feel like you have control over your expenses, which means you have control over your financial freedom. And with that level of control, you have an extreme level of empowerment um, that will come with it. So if you want the gift, you got to go, you, you know, it's like the same thing. You want the treasure, you got to slay the dragon, right? The expenses and getting into the expenses is slaying the dragon. Cool. Let's keep rocking. Next thing, right? Here's another keeper. Another keeper question right here for us. This is going to be our taxes, right? And getting to know your taxes, you can, what you want to do here is look at like, what are your prior year's tax returns to find out like what your tax rate is going to be. I'm seeing people that are coming in through, um, through the Royal Tax, through our insurance strategy consultations, they're at like a 35% range, especially if they're high W-2 earners, right? Um, a lot of people are coming in at like 25%. We would, I think that the uh, the the per the where I see people typically dialing it in is around that 15% mark. Now I do have some people that we work with that are in that like 5%, right? And there's ways that they can get that we've even seen people actually have like a zero tax liability not for how they put that together. Yeah, this is for federal. Uh, federal LN state, we're talking about like combined taxes. Sometimes like if you're living in California, it can be even higher than 35%. But what I'm talking about here is this, like when we look at all of the taxes, what we're trying to figure out, bro, is um, <clears throat> like what out of the money that the government is stealing from us, right? How can we keep it? And so that we just say, hey, great. This is just, that's the, what's my number? My, my, my contribution to you, to the United States treasury number. And I want to get that lower. In fact, actually, that's what IRS told us. IRS tells us you only have to pay the taxes you owe. They don't ask us to pay any more in taxes we owe. How do they know how much taxes we owe? It's because what's legally permissible. So IRS actually tells us that we should do everything that's legally permissible to have the correct tax liability for us. And it's not cheating or stealing. You're not doing anything wrong. It's actually what they told us to do. So if you're smart, strategic, and educated and have a group of people, then you can start driving this number down by finding out what are the things that other people are doing that, hey, if I'm at a 30% when I do my calculation, well, what are people doing at 25%? What are people doing at 15%? What are people doing at 5%? And you can start to drive your tax number down right? Similarly with expenses, this is, well, I'm living this type of lifestyle. Let's doing it, doing my lifestyle this way. Well, how did, how did I get, how do I, can I, can I cut $4,000 a month off of my expenses? So I was coaching somebody on this and uh, I was looking through their expense numbers and I was like, Hey man, you spend $7,000 a month on your Amazon credit card, just buying stuff from Amazon, just buying stuff from Amazon. What did you have from Amazon each month that's worth it? Are you building an entire home gym each month? Like, what are you doing that could possibly be that? And I was like, what, what did you get out of it? He's like, no, nah, I just, I just, as I'm like walking through my day, um, when I think of things that I think I might want or need, I just open up the app and order it. And I was like, oh, so you're addicted. You're addicted. You've, ma you've made shopping too easy for you right? So let's just shut down the Amazon card. And just by doing that one thing, we were able to, to lower the expense number drastically by just making it more difficult to buy, right? Um, so those are the types of conversations that we have of saying like, once we're aware of the expenses, we can start to see like, okay, what's contributing to them in ways that we can modify behaviors that would otherwise lower expenses. And actually, in, in talking to them, 
Um, he found that in getting rid of the Amazon card and, and lowering expenses there, he had zero impact on his enjoyment in life. There was zero things that he actually needed from Amazon, but he was just in the process of spending money. As we all can think, we could probably get to if we were focused on it, right? There's probably ways that we're spending money that aren't really impacting our quality of life. Great. So then our next step here, guys, we're looking at is what is our total taxes and expenses? So this is, if I add up all my expenses and taxes, this is what gets taken from you because of your, the, your lifestyle um, or your behaviors with money, um, as well as your tax strategy. And after you dial in that number, you take your total income here, and then you subtract out your expenses. And that gives you this number, which is your total left to invest. Your total left to invest is a critical number because your total left to invest tells you how much gum powder you have to be able to go out there and make a move with. And what you can find is, is saying, oh, great, if I can increase my income and decrease my total taxes and expenses, now I have more capital and more capital makes all of your investing life easier. Your goals that you want to be able to make with your passive income goals that we talked about up here at the very top of whatever that number is going to be becomes easier when you have more money that's left to invest. And it'll be more secure with your money that you have left to invest. Why? Because with more capital, I don't need as high of a return to get me where I'm trying to get to. With more capital, I can make safer and more secure investments that have smaller payoffs, but still get the net income benefit that I'm looking for, right? So if you're looking for a way to say, hey, listen, I'm a conservative investor, then I'd say, well, great. Then, you're, then the thing that you would might want to focus on um, if you're really conservative is, well, make sure that you're stockpiling as much capital as you can, because now that, that would be the move that you're going to need to be able to get where you want to go right? If you have a small amount of capital here that's left to invest and you have big goals for your passive income, what does that tell me you're going to try to do? You're going to try to start taking home runs. You're going to start gambling with your money, right? And then we have to have a different conversation about that, right? Which is, hey, is gambling really the way? If you're looking for best practices to be able to reach financial freedom and do it in a way that's going to be a predictable and controllable. And say, man, maybe some of your mindset's off about like what's going to be something that as traditionally worked for other people. <clears throat> so I hope you guys are seeing here that it's like the tools and the numbers, these look really simple as we're going through far, right? And we're just talking about income, expenses, taxes, money left to invest, but the conversation and the insights about where am I think I'm trying to go and how am I going to get there becomes much more clear for how are you setting yourself up for success and what are the types of investments that I'm going to need to be looking for. So the next piece here that we guys that we look for is this is the amount of money that we actually invested. So I might had, let's say I had $50,000 here left over um, after my income, my expenses and taxes get out. So I said, great, I have $50,000 left to invest, but what happened if I only invested $10,000? What do you guys think that means? What challenge is this person having if they have $50,000 left to invest and they only ever invest 10,000 for them? Probably means they don't have deals, right? They don't have like the deals that they're looking for and being able to do it. So if we saw this from this person, we'd say, well, great. Looks like you're doing well on controlling your finances, but you're actually, your issue looks like is you don't have the right deal flow. So that might be one of the things that you need to key off on in action steps is increasing your deal flow and deal pipeline. Um, great. <clears throat> Next piece, look at here is what's going to be your total net worth. So let's say we go ahead here and say, well, actually, after if I looked at all the equity that I had in my real estate, um, not all the cash and all that, not all the uh, debt and everything, but just the equity, right? If I liquidated everything in my life, sold all my stocks, sold all my real estate, what would this number be? And let's say that's $1 million. So it's like, cool. So now I know I have a, a net worth of $1 million. And then the next piece I want to look at is what is my passive income in proportion to my net worth, this last number. So if my um, net worth was like a million, right? And let's say that my, my passive income that we talked about up here was 5,000. How does that tell you how well um, my portfolio is doing? So if it was $5,000 a month in passive income, right? And I had a million dollars in total net worth, 
what does that mean for my percentage of passive to net? How well is my total portfolio performing? So that'd be $60,000 over $1 million, right? You guys remember these tricks from school? So I would tell you that it's at six over 100, right? So I would tell you you're performing at a 6% return. Now, I'll tell you 6% when if you guys go through this exercise, 6% is not what I typically see from people coming in off the street for the first time that they've done this exercise and they've, done, they've used this tool. What we typically see is 3%, 2 to 3% is typically what you're actually seeing. So what, what kind of awareness does this give us? Well, this tells us, hey, you might be focused on really home run one-off deals, but you're not really focused on how the entire portfolio is performing. So maybe we need to go through and look at all of your investments to see, hey, I'm, I know that you're stoked that you have some investments that are paying you off 15%, but what about those investments that you're holding on to that are like in the zero to 1% range? The ones that you have mortgages on them that are so freaking high that you it like basically it's equal to the rents and you're just holding on to them. And why are you doing that? Could be really good reasons to do that, right? You could say, well, Scott, I'm actually really targeting net worth here. And I just, and I believe in my crystal ball that the values of those assets are going up. And so this is a net worth, uh, a net worth play for me. That's great. Nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with targeting net worth um, inside of a play. What is wrong is not being clear about um, that what is your target number that you're going for and what is your passive income that you're going for, right? If those aren't clearly defined, then you run in um, to all kinds of issues because you're not operating in a way that's going to give you intentionality um, to what your targets are going to be. So this is the number one, uh, number one tool uh, to fill out. I'll tell you guys, it typically will take at least two to three hours. I know it doesn't look like much, Typically, it's two to three hours because that's it, usually this expenses is what takes you quite a while. And also to trying to determine what your net worth is and your passive income to net. Most people don't have that um, already organized, but they're essential to have organized to be able to drive, uh, to drive around into it.